uh, good evening uh, and good morning from the Philippines. Uh, my name's Abraham Ignacio Jr. I'm the librarian for the Filipino American Center here at the San Francisco Public Library, and we're bringing you this great collaboration and talk today with uh, the great and well-honored author, uh, Yvette Tan, along with uh, Lilian Villaraza in conversation. So I hope uh, to, you know, I know we're gonna have a great evening here tonight. So anyway, before we start, let me uh, start off with our virtual talk on land acknowledgement, because we are in the land of the Ramatush Oiloni, and we need to uh, acknowledge their presence and our presence on their land. So the San Francisco Public Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaytush Ohlone peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as the first peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramaytush community. So uh, that being said, I want, want to do an introduction of our two uh, guests today who will be leading our discussion, author and conversant. Uh, Yvette Tan is one of, the most of one of the Philippines' most celebrated horror writers. Aside from short fiction collections in English and Tagalog, she's written a feature film that featured uh, that received nationwide release and, and a co-written a libretto for a ballet that was performed by Ballet Philippines on the main stage of the Cultural Center of the Philippines. She was the official scribe of the Manila Biennial Biennale in 2018, and her story was the companion piece to the artwork that adorned the Philippine Pavilion in 2021 Frankfurt Book Fair. She co-hosted Tressie After Dark, the behind-scenes companion to the Netflix hit anime Tresse. She was a creative consultant to the Filipino game inspired by the country's mythical creatures and her latest short story collection, Siki Hor and Other Stories, was nominated for the 41st National Book Awards. Just recently, <coughs> excuse me, just recently, she won a Nick Joaquin Literary Award for her short story, Horror Vacui, published in Philippine Graphic, August 7, 2023. Her works have been translated into Spanish, Czech, and Hungarian. Our other guest today, Dr. Lilian B. Villaraza, is the Chair of Philippine Studies at City College of San Francisco, a historian by trade, a storyteller by heart, she also serves as a national scholar for the Filipino American National Historical Society, guest editor of the forthcoming Fonz Journal 12, and chapter administrator of the Filipino American National Historical Society, San Francisco. In her spare time, Lillian loves doing nerd nuggety projects like archiving and documentation of historical materials with different families, geeking out on Filipino and Filipino American literature and looking for Filipino reference in movies. Uh, I, Barbie, and other forms of pop culture. Uh, so just before we start, um, we will uh, do a, at the end of a 15 minute Q&A so people can participate uh, in our discussion after the conversation between Lillian and Yvette. Okay, shall we begin? Yeah, hi buddy. Hello, hello. So um, I'm really excited to have this conversation with Yvette. And um, if you have not read her books, please go get them. They're at the library um, and read them. But I will say this, um, and I think I told Abe and, and Yvette, I, um, I had to put them down after every single one, <laughs> every single story, almost every single story. So I'm like, and it's dark outside. I'm I I can't. I need to stop reading. <laughs> Just need to stop reading. Um, but the 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 writing is magical, um, and it's so. Um, there's no other way to say this. And I was I was watching a um, an another kind of group interview you were doing. Somebody admit it's like you know your your writing is kind of meanders, and I'm like, no, it's Filipino. 
Like it's so Filipino in in that way of like you gather all of these. You you have to set the scene. You just have to set the scene for all of this to happen. Um, so, um, I I'd asked earlier how many folks have read um, any you know some of um, Yvette's work, and you know maybe what we can do first is um, have you talk a little bit about your work generally. Um, you know what brought you to horror. Um, and do you kind of consider all of the work that you write horror in that idea of horror? Okay. Uh, wow. Um, wait, can we start with one question? <laughs> yeah, <I'm sorry. laughs> this, this is what I, my students, my, my students are just like, wait, how many questions did she ask me? Uh, can, okay. So first, can you tell, tell <laughs> Can you tell us generally, like, um, just to familiarize our audience with your work, um, tell us generally about your your um, some of your some of your works. Um, yeah. Okay, so I have I I am Yvette Tan. I write um, what can be categorized as horror. I uh, I have three books. So there's Waking the Dead, Waking the Dead, Seeky Horror, and then I have a third book called Kaba. Eh, which is in Tagalog, and I'm super proud here. Uh, I don't know if you can see it there. Yeah, got it. Uh, it's it's tiny. It's for bathroom reading. Uh, it's for <laughs> like it's super duper short stories in Tagalog, and I'm super proud because I grew up speaking English, mm. and I uh, so to have a book in in like Tagalog is super like super big for me. I'm like to all my teachers in high school and grade school. Yes, I learned stuff. Mm, I feel that um, right yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like so for people who are worried that their kids uh, like Rob speaking English I'm like there's hope I am proof <laughs> <laughs> so did you write it yourself uh, in Tagalog yes I wrote it myself uh, in Tagalog uh, but it's okay. super conversational Tagalog it's not mm. deep Tagalog which is mm -hmm. I think also why a lot of people like it's super accessible. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, uh, I it was published by ANS Publishing, which is under um, Tahanan. By the way, my two books are published by Anvil. So Kabayo was published by ANS Publishing under Tahanan, which is a children's, uh, which mo mostly sells children's books. And mm -hmm. they had a problem with it, problem because they bring it to fairs. And book fairs and stuff and the kids would love it but the teachers would be like oh horror na katakot oh. like they'd see the cover or they'd hear that it's horror and automatically they'd shut it down oh no and uh yeah which is which is sad because horror has such a bad rap when mm -hmm. really it's such a, it, you know it's a good vehicle for uh, the range of human emotion mm -hmm. and um like people Doug Winter, like American um, horror editor, like I like he has a saying that everyone likes to use now, and that horror is an emotion; it's not a genre. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like to take into my work as well. That horror is an emotion. Uh, it's uh, like when I give a talk, a lot of people expect to be like horrified, scared, grossed out, but I I uh, I try to show them the use of horror in in society about how it's uh it's a vehicle for compassion uh a vehicle for rage it uh there it it's it, it uh it's an emotion more than a genre basically and then to answer your next i don't know if i answered your first question but to answer your next question how i got into horror is that i didn't choose horror horror chose me I was super like uh I, I have to stop saying this now because I don't think it's true anymore, but I was super I was such a scaredy cat growing up. I was scared of everything, which I realize now might have been childhood trauma. But um so I was scared of everything and I really wanted to put into word I really wanted to put into words what I felt, I guess. But I was also super interested in the supernatural, the paranormal. Um, I read a lot of like real, like true, true supernatural books. So, you know, the time life books, 
like super, the supernatural is such a big thing um growing up the the Osborne books and hauntings um like all these books on real life hauntings and we didn't have that in the Philippines not so much and I wish that uh I want there were these are the I wanted to read stories that I couldn't find so I had to write them myself and that's how I got started but also at the same time I didn't know I was writing horror uh, a friend had to sit, like, I'd write what I wanted to write. And then people would get scared. And a friend actually had to sit me down and say, you know, what you write, like you said, arm around me. You know, what you write is actually horror. <laughs> and that's when I figure out, oh, okay, so maybe I could just put this under horror. But in reality, I don't think of it as horror. Because if you grew up in the Philippines, especially in the 80s, not so much now, uh, but in the 80s, it was still very... Everyone went on Monkey He Lot. Uh, you got TV show, like you got weird things on the news. Like I remember watching Eye to Eye, which was this uh, showbiz show uh, hosted by Indai Badidai. And there was this segment where she talks about, like she talks about fantastical things uh, on the regular. And there was this one segment where she talked about this woman who gave birth to a fish. So, babae ng anak ng dalag. And then you have a picture of the, of the, no, you have a video of the woman with a like basin and her baby fish. And at some point, Indai Badidai becomes the godmother of this fish that this woman birthed. And you don't know if it's real or not. I, I obviously, I think it's not real anymore. But back then, you were like, what's going on? Um, and then, of course, uh, so I was a, I, I am a martial law baby. I was born during the martial law era. And uh, you had, the, you you know how the press was controlled back then? Like everything, uh, you you didn't know what what was real and what wasn't anymore. And so you, you heard a bunch of stories. And that one of those stories that I heard growing up in Manila um, in the 80s, uh, which was the bridge. I heard that story in the 80s growing up in, in Manila, but it actually happened. Uh, the story started in 1972 in Leyte or Samar, probably Leyte. So uh, you had like all these stories travel traveling around the Philippines uh, and becoming, becoming real because... Uh, you know how folklore is a vehicle for, in a sense, control, but also in a sense, safety. And it kind of, this was kind of, this kind of had the same function in that uh, it traveled all the way to the Philippines and it was used to tell people, okay, don't leave your house at night, especially to your children, because something bad might happen to you. So there, it has its uses as well. Um, that's how I got into it. I forgot your third question. Oh no, it's it's fine, and I think what's really interesting is that even with you know with Filipinos in the diaspora, that that sentiment followed, right? And it's like okay, these these narratives were often used as a as a um, mode of control and and social pressure. So it's like oh, if you if you do this, the, you know the duende is gonna get you. <laughs> it's like it's like what they can jump, they can jump, and I there. I can't remember what story it is, but I'm like, oh my god, you know, that's um the the idea of these supernatural beings leaving the Philippines is actually downright frightening to me. <laughs> like it's just like, oh no, because <laughs> when I go to the Philippines, I'm super. I go, I get a million times superstitious. It's a little, it's a little nuts. But I'm I'm sitting here going, tabi tabi po, sorry, sorry, oh, sorry, <laughs> please forgive me. You know, because I'm just like, I'm not bringing anything home with me. Mm -mm, no, you know, and and I find it fascinating that this is, you know, and, and I don't know how people kind of take that in now um you know youth and 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 whatnot but i'm i'm sitting here going how can you not be scared like how can you not fear you know the <laughs> something coming on the airplane with you in your backpack like i don't know you know <laughs> but, so, but that's how folklore travels for for all for all uh for all cultures i was gonna say creatures right. for all cultures that's how culture travels like uh <laughs> Um, for example, in the States, you have, uh, what's it called? Ah, 
in the mining communities in the U.S., they have creatures that are that came from England. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Like you have kobolds in, in sorry in Germany, which became mm -hmm. um, I forget what they're called in England, which became knockers in the states, where you mm -hmm. know in mines they knock. So that's how culture travels all over right. the world. Somebody right. immigrates to another country, they bring their mm -hmm. beliefs with them, and right. it's the same for us. Right. Well, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I've, I've uh, actually yeah. heard stories of. Oh, sorry, no, no, I've no, actually no, heard no. stories of. Uh, um, from the states of, uh, I've heard a story of, somebody being possessed by a, uh, a chana. I've heard like like I've heard I there are actually albalarios in the states. Mm -hmm. I've yeah. heard because yes. you know your beliefs follow, mm -hmm. and you need somebody of the same culture to, um, to make everything right again. Yeah, yeah, the practices follow and everything because you know the, the white lady of Belete Drive, they they exist here too on on different streets and different places. Like there, there's a <laughs> I, I grew up in San Diego and everyone in in California and everyone's just like, don't go down that street when it gets dark because you don't want to see the white lady. I'm like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was like, okay, yeah, no, we're not gonna do that. No, no, no. Um, but okay, so I I I wanted to um. I have so many questions. I have so many like, um, and what I I I really found interesting is that your stories represent such a wide range of horror writing, right? From you know, it's like there's this inquisitiveness and questioning on one end, and then you have downright gory and violent. Like, um, <laughs> seriously, for folks, if you <laughs> if you pick up. <laughs> Walking the waking the dead, read Stella the star for star, not at night. <laughs> just don't read it at night, because I'm just like, oh, that's just violent and gory and scary. And but I'm also sitting here going, but it's mixed in with with all these other stories, and I don't know if I'd want to give the whole book to you know a teenager or like a ten year old. It's like oh, here's some <laughs> some Philippine myth mythological like. You know, uh, but I guess my question is, how did you choose what stories to include in in your analogies? Were they all kind of like, these are the ones that I wrote all together? Or, you know, did you kind of pick and choose? Do you have some waiting in the wings? Uh, it was more the former. So I, I tend to, as you noticed, I tend to write super different things, like, which is why Waking the Dead, and I also tend to write super slow, which is why Waking the Dead has a children's story, then it has a super gory story, then, you know, it has all these weird things going on. Um, that's because I I don't have any, I, I, I'm a slow writer, I don't have enough stories to, to put everything, you know, to make sure everything is of, of the same theme. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we tried to fix that in Siki Horror. So in Waking the Dead, it's kind of scattered. In Siki Horror, um, we put it into two categories. So the first one, it's kind of safer for kids. And the second one is a bit more mature. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> there. Yeah, and, and I love the the um, the intros because, and I remember... Um... Because you wrote you wrote it all or you put it all together during the pandemic, right? So there's this feeling of like, yes. um, you know that that kind of panic, like and and there are instructions, right? <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Okay, so the first one, actually, a lot of the stuff. So everything in Siki, there's only one new two new things that I wrote for Siki Hor. Um, and I forget their names. The one, the the, the first one of them was the intro to the second part, the advanced demon summoning. Because everything we already had the uh, demon summoning for beginners, and my editor said, you know, since we're going to separate it into two parts unofficially, you might as well write a, a more advanced one to introduce the second part, which is a bit more uh, mature, a bit more graphic. And then we also needed one more story. So I wrote uh, the one the one that's set in the mountains. I forget what it's called. I can't believe I don't remember the name of my own stories. Um, 
but that one was based on a creature I read in um in Jordan Clark's uh, website. The Aswan Aswan Project. See, I'm sorry. Yes, that's one project. I'm so sorry. It's it's 9 a.m. here, which I know is a normal human time, but I am not a normal human being apparently, and my brain keeps lagging. I'm so sorry. So yeah, I read this. I read I read about this uh creature in the Swang project, where it's a creature in Palawan that he he discovered in like not I, I don't want to say discovered that because that sounds so, you know colonial colonizer but he he encountered that was mm -hmm. told to him um about how they uh they like consume humans and then they eat human beings and then they just leave the jawbone for some reason and they like hang in them on trees and i'm like oh that's such a lovely image let's work with that and then i made stuff up instead of putting them near the the ocean i put them up in the mountains that sort of thing so i added my own own spin to it I think that was and, Dead Season. Uh, I, I tend to do that. Yes, <laughs> Dead Season. Mm -hmm. I wanted to name it Tempo, Tempo Mori, which is the actual name of the Dead Season. But uh, there's already a novel named after that. So I didn't want to repeat that. Mm -hmm. uh, the Dead Season is in between, the, the season in between planting. Yeah. So har in between harvesting and planting, that's the Dead Season. Yeah. So as you notice, I tend to take a lot of stuff from uh, Philippine culture, yeah. uh, which is weird because actually not so weird because uh, obviously I'm ethnically Chinese, but I, 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 I am so much more in tune with uh, the Filipino side of my culture. Like I'm mm -hmm. a fourth Filipino. My grandmother is from Bulacan, so Bulacan mm -hmm. is represent. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, um, but also I know that a lot of the stories I tell, like a lot of the creatures come from the Visayas and that's because again, growing up in the eighties, a lot of the supernatural um, influences, be it from our, our household health or from media or from the Visayas, because like Teca Galiaga and Lori Reyes were huge like directors back then. They had, they, they did a lot of, um, horror films. This is how the Chanak came into popular culture because of the Chanak. Uh, Aswang also, Pekka Galiaga mm -hmm. and Lori Reyes again brought in the Aswang. And these are all mostly from the Visayas and because Pekka mm -hmm. is from Bacolod. Ah. That's why a yeah. lot of our influences are from the Visayas. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think what's interesting is that you have, um, you know, these. I would love to see how other, um, you know, different communities kind of interact with with um, with the narratives and say, oh, well, that kind of reminds me of, you know, of this creature in my community. And it's not, you know, we don't call it that. We call it this. And the Chanak scares me. <laughs> I just want to say that out loud because I'm just like. Oh my God. Um, but yeah, because I I mean the, the Philippines has been a crossroads for you know all of all of Asia, all of um, you know, the world generally. And it's always fascinated me how these different ideas and these different belief systems kind of came into came into the archipelago and you know kind of situated themselves and you know, there are some places that don't believe in ghosts, there are other places that do. Um, and and we, you know, there's not this one monolith of Philippine mythology and and um, and things like that. And I'm just wondering. Um, okay, so I'll ask one question at a time. <laughs> um, are there other aspects of Filipino society and culture that inspire your writing? So you all already said that, like, you know, um, being an eighty, you know, you grew up in the eighties. I grew up in the eighties. So that was an inspiration, and um, and but are there other aspects that um, that we find in your writing? Um, yeah, so I draw a lot from pop culture. I draw a lot from uh, sometimes current events, sometimes uh, history. So, for example, Sticky Horror, uh, the the story. 
that, that the book is named after is about the mail order bride phenomenon. And uh, yeah, so that's a current event. The bridge is from uh, past events. So it's a based on a folk, uh, it's based on an urban ledger that I heard in the 80s. Uh, yeah, like I tend to base it on, because I'm very, very, I'm so in love with the idea of what if. So what if this happened? What if that happened? And that's where I, that's where a lot of my stories come from. So what if there was um, a horror house in Poblacion that, you know, that catered to like weird fetishes, but also be had like, um maybe not quite human people working there, that sort of thing. So uh, that's also what I wanted to say before, before I lost my train of thought uh, about how a, a lot of the stories in Siki Horror, some of them are are really old, but, but they, they still fit now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, her, so the, the story that she's talking about, the horror house, that's the, it's called Her Room Was Her Temple. Don't read that at the don't read that that at night. <laughs> like, do not read it at night. Um, yeah, that, I, I was just. Kind of, I can also see that as a movie treatment. To be honest, I'm like I could see this like on. I wouldn't. I don't know if I'd watch it, but that could totally be a film. Because um, I'm just like, oh my, and and there a number of your works actually. I'm just like, oh man, these are yeah, they're kind of amazing and and <laughs> i i'm um i'm looking through my questions because i'm like oh we're, we're answering most of them um let's see um because we're kind of talking to folks outside of the philippines um i was wondering what sorts of questions you get from folks either filipinos or non-filipinos um about your your the stories and um you know yeah just wondering about the questions that you get and how you respond to them. Oh, the most common question I get is why horror? Like just recently, somebody random messaged me, why horror? And I'm like, why not? <laughs> uh, I Again, I think people have this weird notion. I don't know what they think, like weird notion of horror, uh, maybe because of its name or maybe because of its reputation or uh, that it's, uh, well, obviously it's scary, but also that maybe it's not worth as much as other genres, that maybe it has no purpose in society, um, which I completely disagree with. Like, again, such a scaredy cat growing up, scared of everything, um, but it's only now that I'm, able to articulate the uses of I don't want to say use because it it, it feels very everything has to have a use uh, but there is a purpose to horror and not a lot of people understand this and this is why this is what I always try to emphasize when I uh, give talks it's a again it's a vehicle for compassion a vehicle for rage it it gives us the space to understand um, what makes us mad or what hurt us and perhaps gives us a space to move towards healing as well. Like, for example, uh, whenever we, especially here in the Philippines, whenever we hear uh, ghost stories, we think, we, we, we stop at, okay, may multo, nakakatakot. That's it. Like, there's a ghost, it's scary. That's it. We we fail to think beyond that. Why Why is there a ghost in that area? because somebody was wrong most of the time. It's either somebody was wrong, depending on which theory you believe in. I'm also super, I love the paranormal. I love the supernatural. Like my dream was to become a parapsychologist. So I have background in that as well. Um, so going back to what I was talking about, why is there a ghost in this area? Uh, probably because somebody was hurt. Uh, could also be, again, which depending on the, which theory you believe in, but we'll go with somebody was hurt. So uh, a part of them still still lives there. Why were they hurt? And then we go into history. So horror isn't just, oh, boo, you're scared. It's, uh, 
it's a gateway into history. It's a gateway into somebody did something wrong. Somebody wants retribution or um, maybe not even just somebody like it beyond going beyond why was this person hurt? We go we and we go into history. Then we go into maybe this was something that was happening in the entire country, and that's something. That's something. Whatever it is, was it, it was a war, it was atrocities, it was martial law. These things reverberate to, uh, until now. We're still seeing the effects, and uh, we don't realize it. Sometimes we go about our day not knowing that the way we're acting is a result of the trauma we experienced before. So I think that a lot of hauntings, a lot of ghost stories are the effects of trauma, personal, uh, national, global. Um, and it's also uh, uh, what we what we what we're moving towards now, I feel uh, in the paranormal community, and which I think will is already happening in fiction, happening in mm -hmm. movies, happening in uh, literature is uh, instead of I love the Ghostbusters, but instead of like just busting ghosts, mm -hmm. uh, we the living become psychologists for the dead so that they can move on properly. Mm -hmm. And I think that doesn't just make sure the dead go everywhere, you know, where they're supposed to go. I feel it also solves our trauma as as living yeah. people. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's there's closure, right? Yes. I went to I, my head went to Ghostbusters and Harold Ramey and <laughs> in the most recent one. I, but know, I, I love them so much. That was so good. <laughs> but it I, I really loved your story, Fold Up Boy, because I'm a historian and I'm like, this is a history that I did not know. And I'm, you know, a bad Philippine historian. <laughs> like it's like I should have known like this this thing happened. And and generally, yes, I knew that there was um the 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 Chinese community was 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 constantly you know exploited in some way um during that time frame but his his story was just so sad and um you know he was the, the idea of looking for closure um resonated so much and I, I it was a beautiful story um and and yeah so I was just like thank you um in the so chat that, that yeah. story mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. That story, um, that was my way of trying to find my roots as a Chinese, uh, somebody who's ethnically Chinese. And I didn't know that either. That uh, the, the way it was explained to me is that the reason why in the Philippines you'll find people who are only like third or fourth generation Chinese, mm -hmm. I'm third generation. Uh, so third or fourth generation Chinese is because even though the uh, China and the Philippines have been trading with each other before the Spanish arrived, uh, when the Spanish arrived, like the Chinese kept getting massacred. Yeah. Um, which is why in other Southeast Asian countries, you'll find Chinese uh, who are like 10th generation, mm -hmm. but not in the Philippines. And that's why. Right. I'm so sorry. You were saying you were reading oh. from the comments. Oh no! Um, there, so um, Jonathan said he found I found the story "Fresh Fruit for Rotting Corpses" was very timely, considering a lot of the YouTube vlogs coming out about uh, coming out about Bug Bug. Was this the commentary you were going for? Oh no! Um, "Fresh Fruit for Rotting Corpses" was I wrote that I forget when before twenty ten because a friend of Ours, Alexis Traseca, Canadian, Filipino Canadian um, film critic, was murdered in his house. Uh, they think it his he and his girlfriend were murdered. Um, it was an inside job. One of their maids like um, let robbers in, and they ended up getting killed. It was yeah, it was super horrible. Um, there's still no justice until now for him, and we uh, are one of uh like a lot we were all in media and we we wanted i was working i was writing for a magazine i think it was uno and we wanted to create uh like an issue dedicated to him mm -hmm. so my friend uh, erwin romolo also the reason siki Hor uh got 
got published uh, super fast. Uh, I mean, before its time. I know, before, the reason I had to finish Siki Hor really, really fast, he's also the reason. He, he asked me to write a story about Sisig because that was Alexis's favorite dish, apparently. And that's what fresh fruit was. So again, these stories are super like old. This was, I, this was written before 2010, but mm. it's still timely until now. And this was before the, the whole zombie thing too. Right. I just thought, uh, well, what it would be if you're in a zombie apocalypse, you have no food, um, everything shut down. Like, what would you do? You do you would try to find happy, and you know you know you're going to die at some point, probably horribly. So you're just living one day at a time. What will keep you going? Um, doing things that you love, even if it means having to cannibalize a dead person for it. Technically, they're not dead. They're still she's still moving. But yeah, yeah. My no pun intended. My head went to what the Last of Us <laughs> and, and um, the Walking Dead. I'm just like, oh. <laughs> but yeah, I, and the fact that it was the first story in the book, I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, and where else is this going? There's a, there's a lot of food. <laughs> In, in your narratives, in your stories. I thought that was really interesting. Like, and and I know that you were, I, I don't know if you're doing this um, still, but I know you, you were a food critic for a while and um, you're, yes, you're yeah. doing- I was a food writer, yes. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm just like, yeah, there's a lot of food. <laughs> and, and juxtaposing that with <laughs> horror, I'm just like, <laughs> just, it was so good, so good. Um, Jaina and I, I, I share the sentiment. Jaina, um, Jaina Ray said, um, "Daddy really got me on so many levels." Um, and I know you had mentioned something in another interview I, I was watching that um, it wasn't uh, a true story, or well, I get it. <laughs> you want to talk a little bit about that? It, it's kind of autobiographical because the element, er, everything there has some truth to it except for the phone call. So for those who haven't read it, it's basically about a, uh, a woman named Yvette who gets a phone call from her dead father. Um, like I use a lot of stuff from my life. Like my father did pass away. Like I really, I really was working um, in, at that time, I was working in GMA, the new media arm of GMA, which was fairly new. Um, and then I really did also freelance for music magazine. Like I was, I, I wrote, I was a I freelance for everyone. Music, uh, fashion, music, beauty, travel, food, as you mentioned. So those elements were real, down to the phone I used at that time. Um, even my mom was like, did this really happen? I'm like, no, no, the phone call didn't happen. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but I, I, I didn't I didn't remember. I The only reason I, I, I know that I did this was because apparently I blogged about it. But apparently I wrote that in one night, that story in one night. So um, because my dad's death really hit us hard. And honestly, I mean, I... And as a, as a person who has, you know, I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm an intellectual. Of course, there wasn't a phone call from be from the beyond. But then the other side was like, well, maybe there was. How do you know? How do you know? You know, maybe <laughs> possible. And and this is where, you know, again, in the when I go to the Philippines, I just feel like there's so much more possibility, and I feel like people are mo more in tune and open to the potential of those things where it's not scary. It's just a part of life. It's like, oh yeah, that, that's Lola sitting in the corner. He could, like, he's good. You know, just smoking a cigar or something, you know? So I don't know. It's I, I, actually, and, mm -hmm. No, actually, yeah, I agree. Um, it's uh, so the, the writer and professor uh, Ralph, Galan, he introduced me to the term um, tropical realism, which I feel uh, describes my stories more than horror because, hey, they're just there. Could happen to anyone. Do you want me to tell you something that might scare you even more? 
Shall we take a poll? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, Christina says yes. Says yes. <laughs> oh, you... And Jaina says yes, please. My grandma was my grandpa was like that. If we smelled jasmine, every little thing was like, oh, that was your grandma visiting. Okay, yes, please. So you know how you said that you come to the Philippines and you're automatically more like superstitious. You're scared. You don't want to bring anything home. For me, it's the opposite. It's when I go abroad. Like I've had um, encounters in the States. I've had encounters in Japan. <laughs> like I'm like, I like, bring the salt with me. I'm like, yeah, like super, like I like, got to have my charms. I don't want, I want to, I don't want to bring anything back. So it's the opposite for me. Uh, so like I'm super like if we have time for a ghost story, yeah, uh, and, I'm, and... I'm slightly, and and this, and this you know this happened in the states. I'm slightly intuitive, so you know in 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 Filipino terms, sink it yung third eye ko. It's slightly open, slightly. So I'm slightly intuitive, and I don't want to get uh, and it 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 happened because I went to New Orleans. And uh, so you go to New Orleans and um, you're, uh, so I was there in New Orleans with my friend who's from New Jersey and then she had to go back home. So, you know, when we were together, we did the whole New Orleans thing. We went to the French Quarter, we went to all the cemeteries. And of course we did Pag Pag. Uh, Pag Pag is when you, after you visit a cemetery or a wake, you, you go to a restaurant so that you you lose, or you're a 7-Eleven, so that you lose whoever's following you. Uh, which is why there's a joke here in the Philippines that the 7-Elevens are like, there are a lot of spirits in 7-Eleven because that's where everyone makes pug pug. So there's actually a comic strip about like the, the spirits in 7-Eleven, like trying to romance like one of the sales ladies. It's quite interesting, it's cute. Uh, anyway. So when my friend left, she was like, why don't you go look at the plantations? I'm like, oh, okay, I'll do a plantation tour. So I go on a plantation tour, which is another story. It's on my blog. Uh, and then I come back. Uh, on the way back to the hotel, I hear a voice in my head in Tagalog. And I don't speak to myself in Tagalog. In my head, it's English. I hear a voice in my head in Tagalog say, magpagpag ka. And I'm like... I'm a lazy girl. So I'm like, why am I going to make pagpag? I didn't come from a cemetery. Completely forgetting what is a plantation, but like a sea of death. Like it's built by slave labor. People are buried there. There's a lot of anguish, you know, steeped into the ground. So I go back into the go back to the hotel. I forgot to mention my friend is super sensitive. So when we were there, uh, before, obviously, when she was still there, she'd say things like, Yvette, it's super noisy when we turn off the lights. I'm like, of course not. I don't hear anything. It's probably your side of the room. So that night, I turn off the lights, and it's super noisy, like people are like, banging on the walls. And I'm like, what's, what's going on? I had to turn on, whenever I turn on the light, it's gone. So I had to sleep with the light on. And then the next day, um, my friend... Like, I have a, uh, my psychic friend texts me from Manila. And he's like, hey, uh, who are you with? Like, you got a lot of guys with you. I'm like, what? I'm alone in my hotel room. What's going on? Uh, a couple of, uh, so a couple of um, non-former humans apparently followed me. And I had to ask my friend, I'm like, um, okay, so what do I do to, to make sure they don't follow me back to Chicago, where where I'm from, where I'm going back to? And my friend said, oh, okay, this is what you do. You One of them wants oysters, so find an oyster place, uh, set it down on the ground as close as you can, and uh, they won't follow you. So I'm like, okay. So I had to, you know, I had a whole day. I was flying out that day and I had a whole morning plan. I was going to eat in like this historical restaurant, so on and so forth. Scrapped all that, waited for the restaurant beside my hotel to open, which coincidentally served oysters. Uh, blew my budget on oyster, a plate of oysters, bought one, uh, got one, put it on a plate, set it near the window, which is clo as close to the ground as I could get without being weird 
And what I noticed was the waiters, uh, the waiter would like talk to me, they make sure I was all right, and would not, did not say anything about that oyster at all. And when I left the restaurant, that plate with the oyster was still there by the window. So I'm like, hmm, maybe the wait staff and the spirits of New Orleans have a thing going on. They have an agreement. <laughs> that uh, or at least he knew it was going on. And when I got back, like I can suddenly feel things. Um, not see, not hear, just um like only like big energies. So nothing very concrete still. Um so yes, yeah, so in the Philippines, I'm I'm kind of like, okay, there that things there, sure, just don't follow me back. But when I'm abroad, I'm like, what's <laughs> What's going to happen now? No. <laughs> so I'm very prepared now. I have salt with me. I have whatever with me. <laughs> like, I'm very firm with my boundaries. I'm like, no, you nobody follow. <laughs> if you want to follow, help me pay rent. <laughs> I mean, what what's the American equivalent of a tabi-tabi po? I, I don't know. I, I live here and I'm just like, I don't know. If anybody knows out there, please let us know what the American equivalent is of tabi-tabi po. Because... Apparently we need it here. <laughs> I don't I don't think there is. I think it's really just boundary setting. Mm, yeah, yeah. And like, I mean don't follow me. Hello, yeah. I respect you. Stay there. Right. <laughs> yeah, and Louisiana is definitely a, a very deeply um you know s- spiritual and and um, yeah, lots of things happening in that area. Um but yeah, so it's six fifty six. I wanted to open it up to folks if they wanted to um, come on on their mic um, and ask a question, or maybe talk about one of the stories they read. And you just and you have a question about that. Um, yeah, let's open up the floor. Anyone? So while we're waiting for questions, oh yes, yes Christina, Christina, go ahead. And Sophie, mm-hmm. Sophie has a question. Okay, I have, I have so. a question about um, how you think about humor and that relationship to, or because a lot of your stories are really funny in this dark, <laughs> dark way, and you know, like um, you know, there's there's tension, like you know, with comedians, like humor gets people on edge like you know um so I just wondered how you thought about that and how you um think about that in relationship to um how you write or in horror horror genre okay thank you for that because I am a frustrated comedy writer Uh like uh, um a frustrated comedian um growing up my favorite genre is really comedy not horror at all. So I'm glad that people find my stories funny. And uh, like I said, I'm a scaredy cat. I'll watch, uh, I, I really love, I'll watch, it's easier for me to watch uh, horror movie if it's horror comedy. Mm. Hence Ghostbusters. Oh. And I also think that, yeah, like uh, as, as Christina mentioned, both of, they both have, they, they both have kind of a catharsis thing going on. They, mm-hmm. they, they put you on an they bring you to an edge and then they bring you down either through scare uh, you know scares or through laughter okay that's so Sophia Sophie hello um thank you for sharing your uh, words with us today I really uh the when you said horror is not a genre it's an emotion that really stuck with me and I haven't heard that before. And I'm usually in spaces where people are like, Sophie, why do you like horror movies so much? Like, it's a little bizarre to them. But I appreciate you saying there's always something behind the horror, whether it was someone who was done wrong or there's some story behind it. And so I guess my my question for you today is, um, knowing that horror is not a genre, it's an emotion, was that something you realized through your growth process as a writer or, or how did you come to that realization? Oh, I heard it from Douglas Winter, who's an American uh, horror editor. So he he writes uh, he writes it in the foreword of this uh, anthology called um, Prime Evil, which I think was published in the eighties. And uh, that there's a longer version of 
of it. But that was the gist of it. And now he's just shortened it. The horror isn't a genre, it's an emotion. Mm -hmm. And when you read, like, if you read a lot of, like, I'm sure you know this since you watch a lot of horror films. And if you read a lot of horror books, the ones that, uh, the ones that really affect you are the ones that have more than just scares in them. There's mm -hmm. a deeper story. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you've, uh, if you can get a hold of the Ilongo film Yangao, it was a cinema one film directed by Richard Thomas. My favorite, one of my favorite horror films in the world. Uh, that's a that's an example of that, where it's not just horror. Um, there's a family drama behind it. And I, I honestly, I think that 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 really is so present in your writing which i love and, and i think that part of the reason why your stuff scares me the the things that are really kind of graphic and and frightening is because i can kind of see myself in these narratives that you've crafted i'm like i need to put this down <laughs> like, i don't want to see myself in this um but yeah that's it's really good um does anybody else have any other and sophie thank you for that question um does anybody else have any questions Yes, thank you for your question. Jana says, I think that's why I like Asian horror movies better than American ones. There's more behind them. Yeah. There's always somebody who was hurt, um, mm -hmm. somebody who wants revenge. Or sometimes just uh, you have a mischievous spirit. Yeah, there's definitely that's more the psychology, psychology and par parapsychology. And it just I feel like Asian horror films mess with your head more. Like, I can't watch Thai films. I cannot watch Thai horror films. I watched one once, and I couldn't sleep for two weeks. <laughs> like, like, one eye open. Like, yeah. Um, Massey says, um, Yvette, when you, um, when you combine what if and mythology, what's the extra element that shifts a story from, say, fantasy or horror? Is it emotion? Hi, Massey. Massey's a friend. Um, <laughs> we were in UP together. Um, what if in mythology, what's the extra element that shifts a story from, say, fantasy to horror? I can explain that story. You actually... my, my mute, my, my buttons are not cooperating with me tonight. I apologize. Um, I think you were talking earlier about the inspirations for the stories, Yvette. And, you know, you mm -hmm. can, I know I've seen where I've seen all of these things, the, the various stories that like come your way and the various little bits of things that. Um, it's interesting to kind of see which ones turn into a story for you. Um, but also you, you've got a lot of, uh, you reference things like Tiana, Capre, you know, Tikbalang. And some of these, like um, the story right after the, um, the Fresh Fruit for Rotting Corpses would probably seem more fantastical and not so much horror. So I'm just... I've seen you write in different genres, so I'm just curious, like, what is it for you that shifts it away from, like, fantasy and says, you know, this is actually a horror thing? Or is it more, is it that you brand it, or is it that others are saying, you know what, you are horror? I'm just... I think it's more the latter. at this hour of the day. I think it's more of the latter. Like, people say it's horror. I'm like, okay, I don't know what it is. We'll just go with that. It seems the closest... Uh thing right now but i really think a tropical realism suits my uh my writing more although it, it does still fall under horror uh, um but I, I understand what you mean about fantastical i think you're referring to the story with the kid and the tikbalang uh, see i don't remember the names of my stories that the that last was moon. commissioned last moon. that's yeah last the moon. last yes the last, last moon. moon thank you <laughs> so that was commissioned by the National Book Development Board for the uh, Frankfurt Book Fair uh, because the Philippine booth had a store, like the Philippine booth was uh, had decorations, uh, was, had graphics done by um, Team Manila. So they had illustrations done by Team Manila and they wanted to put everything together. And they asked me to, to put everything together. So what I got the illustrations first, 
before I did the story, which is why that it follows that progression. And I, I think I understand why you say it's more fantastical than horror because it, um, it, it it's more whimsical. The story is more whimsical. There isn't actually a horror. It's not horror at all. And it, it, it isn't set, like even though it's set in our world, it isn't set in our world exactly. It's set in some other plane. Maybe that's where the fantastic, that's why it sounds more fantastic than it is horror. I hope I answered your question. I honestly don't know. So I'm just uh, figuring it out. It's a good question. And uh, I just write what I write, really. So I'm just uh, figuring it out right now as well. And I love that you, the way, I, you know, you write what you want to read, you write, write what you want to write. And I love that. I absolutely love that. Because it's not this, like, you know, chasing after, well, what would an audience kind of like, you know, gravitate toward? I, I think that that's actually really brilliant. Because, I mean, your writing is is amazing. And your storytelling is amazing. And, like, why wouldn't you want to read this? <laughs> like, it's it's really good um christina's asking is is there anything you're afraid to write about or alternately um anything you're really curious to explore through creative flow um nothing i can think of um i have a couple of thing things in the in the i'm working on a couple of things and uh I uh, I wish I could finish them, um, and they're what I want to explore right now. One of them uh, has to, one of them is a family drama. I don't know. I love family dramas for some reason. Only mm -hmm. when it comes to horror, mm -hmm. like I uh, I feel that um, like even when you read history, a lot of our horror, a lot of ghosts come from family drama like uh, a daughter who wasn't allowed to marry the man she loves or a wife who was locked up in the attic, that sort of thing. Um, I'm also trying to write something about the drug war. It, it's been going on for a while, but life gets in the way. So, but yes, yeah, so the, those are the themes that I want to explore. Afraid to write about, uh, I can't think of anything at the moment. I, I find that it, you know, I, I like the question because I wonder about people who are afraid to write about or potentially afraid to write about current conditions in the Philippines because, you know, the, the EJKs are real, you know, and, and the, the targeting mm -hmm. of the press and, and writers is real. Um, and yeah, so I think about that. Um, but you're not afraid. And that's amazing. <laughs> It's it's not that I'm not afraid. And it's also not that I, I actually like, it's it's more like I don't have a choice. So when you said that you like that I write what I want to read, um, I don't have a choice. If I wrote something because I was chasing an audience, it would suck. Mm. So uh, it, it's just the way I'm built. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not something, it's not something I did consciously or something that I did because I want to be different or whatever. It's just the way I'm built. I have no choice. <laughs> In the same way that I write horror, uh, not because I want to do it. It's, I really have no choice. This is what I, this is what comes naturally to me, which, you know, might say, uh, might not, which says a lot about the way I think, I guess. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Mm. <laughs> Well, I, I know that I've enjoyed our conversation. I know that I've yeah. I, I I've enjoyed your write. I look forward to to reading Kaba and um maybe the insect story during the day. Um, but thank you so much, Yvette, for this conversation and for for you know writing what you write and sharing, you know, the Philippines in the way that you do with um us in the diaspora. Um I I I I think it's just absolutely brilliant. Um, so yeah. thank you. No, yeah, definitely. Thank you, Yvette. And oh, just uh, for some folks who are not aware, I think there may be a few, uh, but I think most folks might know. Uh, save the date for October, yeah, October twelfth and thirteenth, which is the Saturday and Sunday, 
we'll be having the Filipino American International Book Festival here at the San Francisco Public Library. And I think we'll probably be talking with uh, uh, on topics like this will be part maybe uh, for a panel discussion. So yeah, please bring and we will definitely probably be having books like Vet's uh, book, uh, current books for sale, hopefully uh, at the uh, Phil Book Fest, so you can get your own copy. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I think this is very. Thank you, Abe okay. and Lillian, for yeah. having me. And thank you, everyone who, who's here for coming. Yeah. I hope everyone yeah. had fun. Yeah. 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 And again, it's at the public library, so yeah. get your copy and. Maybe you'll be on, um, you know, on audio. I don't know if I could listen to this. <laughs> it's one thing to read. It's another thing to hear somebody else. Like, well, not, not in audio book format, just uh, <laughs> ebook, ebook <laughs> format. But I, I, I'd love to hear um, someone there, do a dramatic reading of your stories. There are, there are, um, there are dramatic, there are really, uh, audio formats of the bridge and Siki or only because other people have done it. Ah, so okay. yeah, uh, on YouTube. He, um, yeah, on online, just Google, just search for it. Huh? Uh, wow. the, just search for it. The bridge in Siki Horror. Siki Horror was more recent. I think it was just last February. Um, wow. by um, Philippine Fanfare Stories, the podcast. So they did uh. A reading of Siki Hor. And then Pakingan Pilipinas did a reading of the bridge a long, 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 long time ago. So oh, that might be harder to find. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing that yeah. audio re dramatic reading. Yeah. All right, everybody. Well, it's not quite dark outside. So Yeah. <laughs> so everybody have a good night. Thank you again for being here. Um yeah, yeah, for a little bit, but yeah, enjoy your night. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you, Yvette. That was. Yeah, that I'm was a little nice. all over the place, but. <laughs> oh, we can stop recording no, no, now. No. Oh yeah, you want to stop the recording? Yeah.